Um, welcome to um, our event this evening on June 18th. Uh, I have to look at the calendar to double check that. Um, my name is Raleigh Joyner. Um, I'm the Goethe Institute Programs uh, Coordinator, and I'd like to welcome you, period, or welcome you back to um, our Watch Clutch sessions, uh, where we watch, in this case, Babylon Berlin, and uh, then we talk about it, uh, in this case, with uh, a guest expert, Dr. Hester Baer from the University of Maryland, College Park. Um, and uh, we're really glad that we could continue this um, series and we really appreciate all of the wonderful feedback that we got for the first four sessions that we did on the first season. And so uh, we'd like to round off the summer and uh, continue with season two. Um, so we have some exciting continued um, Weimar programming uh, in store that we hope that we have in store for you all that we hope um, you look forward to as much as we do. Um, before I sort of go on, just wanted to sort of acknowledge a couple of things just about the current time that we're in right now um, and the current situation, especially that we're broadcasting from Washington. Um, for, for those of you who may be new, we are broad I'm broadcasting from on behalf of the, the Goethe Institute in Washington, DC, um, and I live just outside of DC. Um, so just wanted to say um, that this is the first um, major piece of programming we've sort of put out there since um, the murder of George Floyd and since the, um, pro the protests and demonstrations that have been going on um, across the country. And so we just wanted to say uh, that the Goethe Institute continues to stand um, with the Black community against um, acts of hatred rooted in racism. And um, we are very privileged to have our offices in Washington, D.C., which has such a rich history of Black culture, Black history, Black activism, and specifically that we are in the U Street Corridor, which is um, once was known as, uh, at least part of it was known as Black Broadway. And so it's such an amazing thing to be able to have um, that, that presence in, in that really amazing neighborhood. And it's um, across the country, um, all of our partners and colleagues um, in other good institutes um, also are in such wonderful cities and in such wonderful neighborhoods that would not be what they were at all without the black community. Um, and so we just wanted to say that we continue to stand with um, the fight for uh, fight for justice and um, the fight against systemic racism. And um, we think that, you know, continuing to do our programming um, as we do here at Goethe is important because we don't want to necessarily exist as a distraction or as a form of escapism, but rather we hope that we can exist as a place where um, these dialogues continue and sort of cross over into um, these dialogues that were happening at similar times in other points in history or in other cultures in the context of other countries. Um, and we really think that Babylon Berlin especially is um, a good way uh, to sort of view another time in history and another country where um, similar things were happening, um, of course, very, very different, but at the same time, certain things um, certainly do intersect with what we uh, are experiencing right now. So we really appreciate that you all are tuning in to our programming at this time, especially um, as, as well as in general. Um, so um, having said that, um, once again, um, thanks so much for tuning in to Watch Clutch. Um, we're doing Babylon Berlin season two, episodes one through three today. Um, and our presenter is Dr. Hester Baer from the University of Maryland College Park. Um, she's a German, Germanic studies uh, professor as well as a film studies professor. And she dabbles in the women's studies, um, gender studies and comparative literature. Um, and she's um, taught Babylon Berlin as content in some of the courses that she's taught over at the University of Maryland. Um, and I would say that she's uh, uh, one of the, probably one of the best people to have in good hands uh, uh, guiding us throughout this conversation. So uh, really appreciate having her here and really appreciate having all of you here. And we hope that you continue to enjoy the programming that we're putting out. Um, and we hope that it's very thoughtful to you and also thought provoking. Um, so having said that, thanks so much, Hester, for being with us today, and I'll hand that over to you, and I'll mute myself.
Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for being here. Before I get started, I would really like to express a debt of gratitude to Raleigh for all his work um, on behalf of the Grote Institute in DC and organizing the series, um, and also such a great job with moderating the discussion during our first um, round of watch clutches. Um, I'm thrilled to be back tonight to discuss season two of Babylon Berlin, and I'm coming to you from my house in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, I can't see anyone uh, a topic that I'm going to talk about a little bit later on um, in a moment, but I know that there are many uh, people I know in the audience tonight and some of you who I don't know, but who have gotten to know a little bit through your excellent comments. So hello to all, welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us for the first time. Um, I'm going to begin tonight by offering some background on episodes 9, 10, and 11. Um, that is the first three episodes of season two of Babylon Berlin. And we'll look together tonight at a clip as well as a lot of images from the series. After tonight's presentation, I'm going to um, open it up to questions and comments. Um, you should find buttons at the top or bottom of your screen that allow you to post your questions and comments via q and I think we also have the chat function open in case um, you want to make a comment there um, or let us know where you are attending from tonight. We're always interested to see where people are located. Um, as in our watch clutch discussions from season one, I am mostly going to avoid spoilers or information about future episodes, where the series heads next and so forth. But please join us again as we discuss the rest of season two over the next two weeks. Um, and I'm really excited that next week we will have a special guest, Professor Jill Smith from Bowdoin College, um, who will be here to discuss the next three episodes of season two. Um, and she is an expert on Weimar culture um, and cinema, especially gender and sexuality in the Weimar period. So she'll be able to um, speak to some of the questions that you have about those topics. Um, and we're going to uh, kind of change things up a little bit and structure this as a dialogue next time with Jill. So please do join us for, for the next episode. That will be next Thursday. Um, so tonight I want to briefly recap some of the points that have animated my discussion of Babylon Berlin so far, kind of as an introduction for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, um, and also as a kind of a, a refresher for those of you who have been with us for the first four of these discussions that we've done. Um, so I am going to switch over to my slides now. Um, so bear with me just for a moment while I get these up. Uh, let's see. Share my screen. Oh, Raleigh, it's uh, share screen is disabled. Can you oh, gotcha. okay. fix that? Okay, you should be good now. Okay. Great. Um, so just beginning a little bit with production context. And again, this, these are topics that I've discussed previously, but I think it helps to kind of refresh our, our memory of some of these points as we launch into season two of the show. So Babylon Berlin was produced by the production company Ixfilma Creative Pool, which spearheaded a brand new public-private partnership model to fund the series. Um, and this model allowed them to secure 40 million euros, $45 million budget for the first two seasons of the show, which makes it not only the most expensive German language television series ever, but also the most expensive non-English language show of all time. The series has been sold to and viewed in at least 90 countries and territories around the world. And it was also very popular at home in Germany, where it um, uh, achieved an astonishing 25% market share when it was broadcast on public television there. And the show's lavish budget underwrote 185 days of shooting with a cast of 400 actors, many of them very prominent stars of stage and screen, and more than 5,000 extras um, who were involved. Approximately 70% of the show was shot uh, on location in Berlin. And I think it's an interesting aspect of the show that they, they shot all the scenes in one location 
for all of seasons one and two at a time. So all the scenes at Mocha FD, for example, were shot during one shoot um, and interspersed throughout the whole season. So the actors often didn't really know where the plot lines were going when they were shooting certain scenes. The 16 episodes of seasons one and two were conceived of and created together in one um, continuous seven month long shoot and both seasons were adapted from the same novel by Volker Kutcher, Der Nasse Fisch or The Wet Fish. Um, the two seasons were also released together simultaneously, first in Germany in 2017 and then on streaming services elsewhere in 2018, including Netflix in the US. A little bit about the background and premise of the show. Um, it was co-written and co-directed by these three guys, uh, three filmmakers and co-writers, Henk Hans Luften, Tom Tickler, and Achim von Burgius, who have said that they specifically wanted to make a show set in the 1920s because the Weimar era is not well represented in contemporary culture, um, especially in the audiovisual culture of contemporary Germany, in contrast to the Nazi period, which is kind of so ubiquitously present. As co-creator Tom Tickfer has observed, contemporary German film and television tends to depict Nazis as others. Whereas with Babylon Berlin, he says, quote, we don't show a couple of evil guys who turn out to be Nazis. Rather, the show focuses on how in just a few years uh, from the time period of the seasons one and two, 1929, May of 1929, just a few years from now, all of the characters and institutions that we see in the show will be part of the Third Reich in one way or the other, and most will have accommodate, accommodated themselves to the regime or in fact become card-carrying uh, party members. Season two sharpens the show's depiction of the fragile state of Weimar democracy. Uh, the corruption of Weimar's institutions and the violent and opportunistic behavior of individual characters. However, a continued shortcoming of the show, also evident in season two, is that it really does not portray Jewish life in Weimar Berlin in any detail. And the set designer for Babylon Berlin, Uli Hanisch, has said that the showrunners, quote, were not at all interested in a museum-like approach to the Weimar period, <laughs> end of quote, but rather they expressly took liberties in order to emphasize the resonances between the 1920s and the present day, um, something that we see again in season two, and this is something that I really tried to draw out a lot um, during our discussions of season one. As a scholar of German cinema and media, I am an admirer of the show's intricate and multi-layered construction and its intriguing approach to portraying Weimar culture and history. Um, and I'm kind of emphasizing my admiration for the show because not everyone agrees with me about this, um, but I, I do think um, despite some shortcomings that it's a it's a pretty amazing show in a lot of ways um, and and I've been trying to sort of work out um, through these talks a little bit about what I think is so interesting about it, um, a lot of which has to do with its engagement of audiovisual media on kind of a meta textual level and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more today. Uh, Babylon Berlin opens up ways of thinking about the openness and contingency of the Weimar era, uh, the sense that things might have been otherwise or have transpired differently. Um, but at the same time, it does not hold back on showing the per pervasive precariousness and uncertainty of Germany during the late 1920s in ways that may resonate with contemporary viewers. Um, and this is kind of piggybacking on what Raleigh said. The show delves into how the roots of Nazism lie in the social, economic, and political conflicts of the post-World War I period. And at the end of my presentation tonight, I'm going to turn specifically to the depiction of the police in Babylon, Berlin, a topic that is especially relevant in the context of the, the current uh, moment, the interrogation of police violence and corruption, and the calls to defund the police in US cities following the murder of George Floyd and the extensive Black Lives, Matters, Black Lives Matters protests for racial justice that have ensued in the recent weeks. And, and I do think the show, again, resonates in this regard, and, and I hope that we can talk about this more in the discussion period. So regarding the resonance of Weimar at the present moment, I recently came across this quote from New York psychiatrist, Dr. Leonard Grotman in a New Yorker article about the changes wrought by the coronavirus pandemic. Considering life after quarantine, Gropen asks, quote, what kind of world will we find when we walk out of our door? 
I see radical politics, new ways of living, a kind of Weimar New York coming into being. <clears throat> and I found this quote especially striking and I, I wanted to introduce it here, not only because it addresses this kind of broader comparison between the contingency of two parallel moments, uh, the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, upon whose heels the Weimar period quickly followed, and the COVID-19 pandemic of the present. Um, that relates to what we've been discussing throughout our watch clutches. Um, but also, on the one hand, I think this quote is quite interesting in terms of its, its pinpointing of this resonance, but also um, this article specifically attends to the changed role of psychotherapy in the present crisis. And uh, Adam Gopnik, the author, interviews a lot of different therapists around New York City who work with different populations. And as Groupman and these other therapists discuss, uh, the change to therapy derives, of course, from the need to calibrate therapeutic practice to the specific traumas um, of the coronavirus outbreak um, for different populations, um, including populations of color who are disproportionately affected, um, and also medical workers and others. Um, but the, the change in therapeutic practice also arises from the uncanny quality of conducting therapy remotely via media transmission. And the article delves into this uncanny quality in a, in a very interesting way. And perhaps this article spoke to me so much since I've been preoccupied, like many of us lately, with precisely this un, uncanny quality of life on Zoom, um, whether it's during teaching or during events like this one, uh, where I see not an audience of interlocutors present in front of me, but only myself reflected back in this mise on a beam of the screen. Um, and so I found the article quite interesting. And I think this connection brings us to one of the most intriguing storylines of Babylon Berlin and one that begins to gain momentum in season two, namely the therapeutic practice of Dr. Anno Schmidt of the Institute for Suggestive Therapy. Dr. Schmidt's institute connects many of the show's characters and milieus. Schmidt has close ties to the gangster boss known as the Armenian, who benefited from his unique course of treatment for war trauma. And Schmidt also plays an important, though yet murky, still role for Gerion Rat. In episode 10, the Armenian instructs Rat to acquire a radio and tune into a certain frequency at an appointed hour. And when he does, in episode 11, Rat hears a live radio broadcast by Dr. Schmidt. And I'd like to play this clip since I think it condenses a number of important themes in season two. Um, and some of these include the role of modern media in constructing and disseminating political and um, cultural ideas, the potential exploitation of modern scientific and medical discourse by corrupt forces, um, a topic that also resonates today, I think, and the manipulation of the masses by hypnotic leaders. Um, so if you can just bear with me for a second while I exit out of the slides and then share the, the clip from Netflix here. Okay, so I hope that that clip worked for everyone um, and that it wasn't too laggy um, and that you can now see my slides again. So here in this clip, Schmidt notably describes his method of suggestive therapy with traumatized war veterans as analogous to a radio broadcast in which the analyst directly transmits ideas to a patient who then receives and identifies these ideas as his own. His analogy invokes the terms Übertragung and Gegenübertragung known in psychoanalysis as transference and countertransference, but also common parlance in German for broadcast or transmission. Early debates in Germany and elsewhere about the hypnotic power of cinema suggested that moviegoers might be swayed by the power of film to commit crimes. Um, and scholars have noted the ubiquity of narratives about hypnosis and suggestion in the literature and culture of European modernity a tendency that perhaps culminates in the films of German Expressionism, whose prominent mesmerists such as Dr. Caligari and Dr. Mabuza are channeled by Dr. Schmidt in Babylon Berlin. Here and elsewhere in season two, uh, the show develops the traumatized and suggestible patient embodied in this scene that we just watched by the cipher Gerion Rat as a metaphor for the ailing, diseased Weimar Republic. 
We have previously seen in, the, in season one of the show how Schmidt engages the cinematic apparatus in his therapeutic work. And here, in this sequence, we see these kind of material features of the wireless apparatus, including the headphones and receiver that Rat uses to tune in, the radio tower pictured here, um, and this phonograph kind of speaker prominently represented as well. The show's attention to modern media formats really emphasizes their double-edged quality as a means of, on the one hand, enhancing communication and access, but also on the other as tools of manipulation. Um, and the, the broadcasts of Dr. Schmidt toe a line, we're not sure where they fall in, in this kind of dichotomy. Dr. Schmidt's broadcast certainly foreshadows the centrality of the radio as an apparatus to the dissemination of Nazi ideology. And these three episodes really dwell on the ominous quality of many other audio audiovisual technologies as well. And I just want to show you some examples of that. Um, so photographs, in this case, photographic prints of a crime scene trigger Rat's subconscious memory of repressed guilt. Newson watches bent through binoculars, underscoring the sinister alliances that fuel the extreme right at this time. Yenika's murder is foreshadowed by a creepy scene, very reminiscent of the film M, um, in which he is accused by a child of stealing a pair of binoculars. And the excitement of Rat and Grave's first plane ride gives way to physical and mental duress as the plane is first hit by lightning and later shot by anti-aircraft anti artillery. Uh, Grief almost plunges to his death while trying to photograph the secret airbase of the illegal rice there. Um, and the sublime view of the clouds facilitated by the modern feat of flying is undercut by the overt parallel I think most viewers will draw um, that Babylon Berlin makes in the scene to the famous opening sequence of Lenny Riefenstahl's notorious propaganda film Triumph of the Will from 1935 in which Hitler appears godlike flying in an airplane um, into the city of Nuremberg for the party rally. Meanwhile, Babylon Berlin also returns, of course, to Weimar film, following Gerda and Fritz to the movies, where in episode 12, they sit in a crowded working class cinema, pictured here, and view newsreel footage referencing the police's violent suppression of workers' protests on May Day of 1929, as well as a clip about French Foreign Minister Aristide Briand's visit to Berlin to meet with his counterpart, Gustav Stresemann, a visit that will continue to play a role in the show's unfolding narrative moving forward. As the newsreels play, Fritz flirts with Gerda, Ger sorry, Greta, though she rebuffs his attempts at kind of holding her hand or, um, or putting his hand on her thigh, she has to start laughing when Fritz gives her a version of a newsreel inter intertitle saying, communist kisses chambermaid. Um, and at this, Greta really can't help but let Fritz kiss her. Um, and here, Babylon Berlin returns again to its favorite intertext, which we've talked about a lot, the film People on Sunday from 1930, which appears once more as the main feature on the screen. Notably, the, the show defies any kind of normative timeline here, since only seconds have elapsed since the newsreels ended, but the film scene from People on Sunday that now unspools is one that doesn't take place until about 10 minutes into the feature, a scene where the characters Crystal and Wolfgang make plans together. Um, and here again, I think Babylon Berlin is, is flagging for those viewers who are familiar with Weimar culture, the questionable character of Fritz, uh, by, by directly comparing him to the sleazy predator Wolfgang from the earlier film. This season's attention to illusion, suggestion, and hypnosis extends also to its extensive incorporation of dream sequences, reveries, and nightmares, which further expose the psychic lives of the show's characters. Sometimes these dark visions provide crucial details that contribute to the narrative development of Babylon Berlin, as in the series of flashbacks that Rat experiences across the three episodes that, that we're discussing tonight, in which he slowly kind of desublimates memories of killing the nefarious priest Yosef. Rat's flashbacks um, 
blend or blur hallucination and reality in ways that are hard to detect even for the attentive viewer and that sometimes um, as here provide clues uh, towards future developments of the show. Sometimes these visions also offer lighthearted interludes or comic relief, uh, as in the lovely dream sequence with which episode 10 commences, in which Helga and Gerion dance to the strains of the classic 1930 song, Mir es or I'm in the mood for you, as it's translated here. Um, and this song is noteworthy. It was written uh, by Misha Spoliansky and performed by Leo Man Manosin, an immensely popular Russian-born Jewish singer who appeared in numerous German musical films in the early 1930s, including um, a well-known appearance in the box office smash Die Drei von der Tankstelle from 1930, known in English as The Three Good Friends. Um, I particularly like this sequence in which Newsom, burning with shame and anger about being sidelined by his mother at the share shareholders meeting and from his, his broader role in the Newsom company, fantasizes about climbing up on the boardroom table and catwalking his way straight out of the business. Um, and sometimes these kind of visions or reveries are also quite poetic, like this shot of the sky, which we see directly after Lotta visits Yenika's apartment and breaks down crying over soup. Um, equating Lotta, as the show has done on several occasions that we've talked about before, once again with the Hinterhofe or back courtyards of Berlin tenement apartments. This image I think captures how Lotta continues to be trapped by her working class background and family of origin, even as she tries to plot her way out. Um, and, and that background kind of catches up to her in these episodes. Um, the first three episodes of season two endow each of the three main characters with greater complexity. Rat's flashbacks suggest that he has committed at least one serious crime, revealing him to be a more ambiguous character than first suggested in season one, while Bruno Wolter's despicable behavior in collusion with the far right is further exposed. In the case of Lotta, neither Rat nor Volter can fully seem to fathom the extent to which her status as the sole breadwinner for her family and the family's desolate living conditions exert pressure on her. Rat is furious with Lotta for telling Bruno about his drug habit and he kind of punishes her by taking on Yenika as his assistant and rejecting her. And Bruno cannot understand why she plans to continue working at Mocha Efti even after he provides her with the necessary documentation to secure permanent employment with the police, although she, she kind of explains to him the circumstances. The parallel sequences depicting Lotta's and Rat's dead mothers provide a salient visual illustration of the gender and class-based inequality that structures the relationship of these two characters even as it underscores what they also share in common. Um, and I found that very interesting, the, the really strong parallel um, in the depiction of the, of the dead mothers in these sequences. Despite the obstacles that she faces, Lotta continues to exhibit her trademark pluckiness, for instance, quickly trading places with a cocktail waitress in Mocha Efti in order to spy on a meeting between Colonel Vent, police president Suragibel, and the Soviet ambassador. In one of Babylon Berlin's densely layered sequences, emblematic of its mashup aesthetic, this meeting is cross-cut with a performance by art rock icon Brian Ferry, who in a cameo appearance sings um, his, his own song, Bittersweet, from the 1974 Roxy Music album, Country Life, um, a song that was in turn inspired by the Weimar cabaret tradition and particularly by the songs of Kurt Weill. Uh, the original Roxy Music song, which he's reprising here, includes, in fact, a, a, a verse in, in the German language, um, and the lyrics um, of that verse were translated for Ferry by the two German models whom you see here who posed on the cover uh, of the album um, and speaking to this kind of transnational um, aesthetic at the time. Um, the two models uh, were Evelina Grunwald and Constanze Caroli, and Caroli is the sister of Michael Caroli of the Krautbrach band Can. 
Um, so I, I, I had to just kind of throw that in there in terms of the mashup, which is quite interesting. Um, we also hear a snippet of Vile's most famous song, probably the Moritatsa Maki Masar, Mac the Knife from the Three Penny Opera. And I want to thank Jill for pointing this out to me. Um, it's a very faint but a very distinct strain from the song that's playing on this uh, phonograph drifting through the courtyard of Lotta's apartment building in episode nine. And I wanted to mention this point specifically because we will return in some detail to Brecht and Biles' blockbuster, uh, the Three Penny Opera, next week as it plays an important role in episode 14 of the show. Among the dramatic and shocking plot twists in episodes 9, 10, and 11, the murder of Yenika looms large. A generally sympathetic character, Yenika cares for his deaf parents and speaks up on Lotta's behalf when Rat has rejected her. Working for Benda, he spies on the circle around Vent, responsible for il illegally smuggling poison gas into Berlin via the Soviet train, a circle that we increasingly recognize also includes Bruno Wolter. Notably, in episode 10, Wolter has observed Yenika watching the group through binoculars. Yenika's murder scene draws on the generic vocabulary of film noir, and we see this here um, in this shot and in the next two that I'm going to show you, um, using chiaroscuro lighting schemes, looming shadows, and the echoing sounds of running feet. These stylistic choices signal the show's thematic attention to one of the enduring preoccupations of film noir, and that is uh, the corruption of the police and the injustice fomented by crooked cops. In the opening scene of episode 11, the Soviet ambassador expresses surprise at Rat's pursuit of evidence documenting the actions of the illegal Reichswehr, telling him, I don't understand you, you're working against your own country. Rat replies, I work for the police. Even as the work that Rat purports to undertake with Benda to combat German remilitarization efforts appears laudable, his declared allegiance to the institution of the police has a notably sinister ring here, especially given what we know about the Berlin police's violent crackdown on the workers' protests and the plot that they fabricated to cover up the shooting of civilians on May Day. Following the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police, a widespread interrogation of police violence and corruption has ensued over the past couple of weeks in the United States, um, really since the last time um, that we spoke, these events have transpired. And one immediate consequence of this interrogation has been the call to combat the overrepresentation of the police in popular culture and to rethink styles and genres that valorize them or that tend to valorize them. Um, at least two cop shows have been canceled um, in, the, in the past couple of weeks already. The reality shows Cops and Live PD um, and other long running cop shows claim at least to be scrutinizing their depiction of the institutions and individuals involved in policing. Um, and in this context, I would be very interested in hearing your own thoughts about how recent events have affected your viewing of Battle on Berlin, and especially how you view this show's portrayal of individual cops, of the institution of the police, and of their role in the precarious social and political moment of May 1929, a moment that continues to resonate uh, in many profound ways with the present day. So I'm going to stop there, uh, stop the screen share, um, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you to Hester again for the um, wonderful presentation. Um, to everybody who is um, tuned in and would like to join in the conversation, um, just a reminder that the Q&A function is at the bottom of your sort of control panel that you have on the Zoom window and also um, the chat function is also available. Um, usually, I mean, I, we would prefer just so that we can streamline it that the Q&A function um, be where everything sort of goes. Um, and if you have any sort of side comments, um, feel free to leave those kinds of um, thoughts in the chat. Um, so to start off, we do have a question um, from Emily. Um, she asked, I'm wondering about two things. One, what do you make of the sequence between Newsom and Vent, and as Vent is washing his horse after riding? 
There are so many odd and abrupt cuts in this scene. My second question has to do with the scars on so many of the men's faces, particularly in episode 10, which is also episode two. They have that numbering just, just for everybody's uh, reference. It's episodes one to three of season two, and then also it's sometimes called nine, 10, and 11. Um, so particularly in episode 10, the camera is often focusing on these scars, particularly on Nusen and Ben's faces, but others as well. Is this a creepy Verbindung fechten thing, a nod to the damage of World War II? Thanks so much. Hi, Emily. <laughs> I'm glad you could join us. Um, so yeah, great questions. Um, the scenes between Vent and Nusen um, in season one uh, here again, and also moving forward into season three um, are all characterized by this kind of choppy editing. Um, in one of the previous uh, sessions, we talked a little bit about the kind of campiness of um, the portrayal of of these characters, um, both of the actors, um, Ben O'Fearman and, and Lars Eidinger, they really like camp it up in their performances of these characters. And I, I find that really interesting and I haven't um, completely developed like a careful analysis of what's going on with this, but it's a topic that I really like to think about more. Um, in this particular sequence, the horse washing sequence, I mean, there's, there's something very homoerotic, I think about the whole scene. You have, you have um, first of all, um, Newson looking at Vent, you know, riding the horse through the binoculars, and there's something very kind of uh, scopophilic and erotic about it. Um, and then you have this kind of the, the horse as the as the mediating figure um, here, and and uh, also Newson is wearing this incredible outfit. I, I have to point out, it's like this this outfit with the with the kind of bell bottom pants, yeah. this kind of suit. It's 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 a really amazing outfit, um, and and I think it's 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 a, it's a really great scene. Um, and what you point out is is you know, the, the odd quality of the editing, it really calls the viewer's attention, I think, to the relationship between these men and, and what's going on here. Uh, Newsom in general tend, like, continues to be one of the most interesting characters in the show to me, and I, I do think it's part, partly due to the performance of Lars Eidinger, who's just like so great in this role. Um, you know, the, the character is so despicable, but the, the, the way that he portrays the character is so really interesting. Um, so yeah, thank you for that comment. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I do think it's a way of calling, calling our attention to that sequence a little bit and to this relationship and kind of thinking, thinking about it a little bit more. Um, thanks for pointing out the, the point about the scars, because I'm sure a lot of people have been thinking about that. It's not something that I have talked about before. Um, I do think, um, yeah, the camera really focuses on the scars. Um, we see the scar on uh, Vent's face through Yenika's binoculars. So this like extreme close up through the binoculars on the scar. I think that's the, the scene that you're mentioning in episode 10 and the camera really dwells on these scars. Certainly they are exactly what you um, suggest. They are scars from duels um, and they are sort of uh, marks of honor uh, from this uh, culture of dueling, this kind of fraternity or, or um, aristocratic culture of dueling um, that uh, continued through the uh, World War I era. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, this culture was, was banned or outlawed even um, in the Weimar period. I, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I, I think it's, it's not something that was um, persisting in the 1920s, um, but these men kind of um, of this generation were really sort of still wearing these scars as badges of honor. Um, and I do think that it is a sign of their allegiance to this previous, you know, culture that is like also a motivating factor for their, uh, for their right-wing activities in the present day. On the topic of your, your comment about camp and Lars Eidinger's portray portrayal of Nusen, um, you know, it is interesting that you mentioned like the continuing of this sort of very camp, you know, sort of quality that his character has, and also that you mentioned his his outfit because um, I would almost want to say that I feel like the 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 creators should or would know better um, than so I'm not really sure what it is, but the idea, uh, I mean, his character almost reminds me of like the old fashioned like sissy villain trope. Um, 
that you see often like in Disney movies. So like um, the idea that a lot of the villains from like Disney movies going back, um, if they're men, they have a very like defined swish, <laughs> you know, something about them is campy, it's effeminate, you know, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily a typical, uh, you know, representation of, of masculinity. And I was wondering like, if you had any thoughts on, um, you know, like the correlation between, you know, Hal Newsom's um, sort of sexuality, gender presentation sort of unravel throughout the show. Um, and um, whether like, uh, like, uh, and I'll, sorry, I, I got distracted because somebody said the, the screen is blank. I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if that's a problem with one person or if it is many people. Sorry, but I was just gonna say, yeah, if you had any thoughts on like what they might be trying to do by portraying Newsom as sort of like a different form of masculinity throughout the show, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I, I, that's a great point. I mean, the point about the Disney character is really interesting and I, that's not something that I had thought about before, but I mean, actually that scene where he walks down the table kind of comports with that, uh, that kind yeah. of thing, <laughs> you know, and the way that he walks in that scene and stuff. I, I think that's an interesting point um, that you make. Um, uh, I, what was I gonna say? Um, uh, yeah, I, d I do think that there is this uh, implication that he is a mama's boy, that he has a conflicted relationship with his mother, as well as having been sort of um, coddled by his mother. Um, and, and there is a lot of, I mean, we might say that there's a, a degree of stereotyping in the portrayal of this kind of aristocratic dandyish, like kind of mama's boy, uh, sissy type figure. Um, you know, I think so. Although I also just think that Lars Eidinger is so, is so great that he kind of transcends any uh, kind of narrowly defined or like flat characterization of, of the figure in that way. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the scene is is so iconic in a way. I mean, he is released from prison and expects to make this very important kind of presentation at the shareholders meeting. Um, and then he's without even being told in advance, completely sidelined and um, take, you know, relieved of his duties on the board. Um, and this sets up some really interesting developments with this character in season three of the show as well. So I won't spoil that, but um, it's noteworthy um, what happens in, in these episodes with Newsom. Yeah, and we do have um, a comment from uh, a very um, uh, astute comment from Marilyn. <laughs> Could it be that Newsom is a privileged entitled son who didn't earn his position? Um, <laughs> and sort of on that, as well, um, Jill has submitted, um, Newsom's mark, however, is a birthmark as opposed to a scar, which might signify his troubled relationship to his mother and then question mark. I'm, I'm not sure if there's like some interpretation that goes along with that. Um, and then on um, the outfit that Newsom's wearing, um, Jill says, I believe that the costume designer and Eidinger collaborated on a book that Eidinger called Marlene Dietrich inspired. Um, so that's interesting. And also just on that, the relationship with his mother, I thought that it was interesting at all that his mother, you know, is the matriarch of this sort of industrialist family. I mean, I know that it was happening at the time, but you know, it is remarkable that she st stands there and addresses a board room of shareholders who are almost entirely men, if not all men. Um, and also that found, I found it also kind of striking that, you know, he's sitting, his mother basically emasculates you know, in, in a sense, probably to him, him in front of this whole group of people. And, you know, what does he fantasize about getting up and strutting across the table and disrupting basically the way this is running and just leaving? Um, so, yeah, that was, do you have any? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it's really important to yeah, point out uh, that, that it's not, that Newsom's mark is not a scar, that it is birthmark for sure. I mean, I think that's really important. And and let's also recall that that Newsom, you know, had this very strong relationship with Sorokina um, and was attracted to um, also Nikoros, Sorokina's alter ego um, in the first season. Um, they have this kind of contentious relationship, but apparently a, a romantic or sexual relationship um, that is um, 
that is especially fueled by by her when she cross dresses um, uh, for him. And so I think that his portrayal in terms of gender and sexuality is is very ambiguous. And um, and it it I think it's important in the show, you know, in the sense that it emphasizes that there was experimentation and play with gender and sexuality across political spectrums in the in the Weimar Republic. Um, uh, and you know his character is kind of emblematic of, of that fact. And one thing I was interested in just going back around to was you mentioned sort of the presentation by um, Anno Schmidt um, of human as like a machine-like um, entity and that sort of continues throughout season two with this idea of uh, the mensch machina um, and I thought is there any other like I was thinking about when he's when he's doing this broadcast um, it cuts to what I believe is the Funkturm in Berlin um, but I can't tell I mean it looks like a lot of Funkturm but I think it was that one which I think was constructed in the like mid 20s like 24 or 26 or something like that yeah. and it got me thinking you know how interesting it is that when you think in general of the skyline of berlin i mean when you think of new york you know skyline you think of buildings you know i don't know the skyline of paris you think of the eiffel tower you know there's uh, london you think of big ben with berlin when you think of the skyline you think of um I mean, if you're cons if you're counting the Funktorm, uh, at least two major things that are in fact um, apparatuses, apparata, <laughs> apparatuses, being the Fernsehturm, uh, the TV tower, and then the Funktorm, which is the radio tower, and those two things being such major, um, having such, which I think the Fernsehturm was like 1965 or four or something, but like that those two things. Um, are so prevalent in the, the idea of the machine, but also that those two things are such notable um, I mean, I characteristics, you know, in the um, in the the skyline of Berlin. It's almost like it, the city itself has that, you know. And and now I'm thinking of like you know the symphony of a great city, and you know that kind of bringing back around to that. Um, yeah. Do you have any sort of thoughts like? on, you know, the sort of functioning of Berlin as a city, you know, uh, a modern city with sort of the, the sort of treatment of like human as machine. Yeah, and I mean, I, also the, the Funkturm and like that was the case in other major European cities as well. I mean, it became like a tourist attraction also in in soon after I think it was built and, and it was a, a location where you could go up um, and, and visit it. I think there's a cafe uh, up in it and, and you can still, I mean, for sure you can still do that with the Ferenczi Torm. I'm not sure about the Funk Torm. I've never been up in never there. Never been to the top of that. <laughs> um, There's a lot of things you can go to the top of in Berlin. Uh, but, but I mean, it became this, you know, this not only a predominant aspect of the city skyline in Berlin, but also this, this major tourist attraction. Um, and as such, it plays a strong role in the, the novel uh, by Volker Kutcher, I think it's the first one. Um, there's kind of a plot line that that happens there. It's kind of removed from the show, but um, but elements of that remain. And and I, I think this um, this notion of transmission and of the way that um, media become you know pr prosthetic aspects of the human body that have psychic consequences is one of the things that the show really pursues in season two and this mensch machine kind of human machine um, assemblage uh, concept is also taken up really strongly in, in season three um, moving forward um, so yeah I, I think it's very interesting I mean like what does rat? What does rat think that he's doing when he <laughs> puts on this listening device and tunes into this broadcast? Um, I, th I think it's really uh, intriguing how this this um, scene portrays the notion of therapy, sort of something that could happen against one's will or without one's knowledge, um, and uh, sort of piggybacks in this way onto this whole history of um, of cultural representations of hypnosis and suggestion, um, many of which have been tied, you know, as we talked about um, previously, at least since um, Siegfried Krakauer's um, reading of 
of Weimar Cinnamon from Caligari to Hitler to this kind of proto-fascistic idea of the manipulation um, of automaton-like or somnambulist-like individuals um, to perform acts against their will. Um, and so I think we have to ask, you know, what is Rat doing um, in this season and like what happened with the priests and, and how did these uh, culturally resonant uh, components um, uh, cause us to read kind of his actions um, and, and his relative consciousness or lack thereof about his actions um, across this season. And these topics will continue to come up in, in future episodes as well, for sure. Yeah, and I was also thinking of um, just imagining what it must have been like in the 1920s to see something like a giant radio tower go up in your city. I mean, not only do I think that that would inspire some, you know, awe, but like, fear as well and like not trusting that like what is that doing is it going to control my mind you know i mean people still have a, a very deep i always get mistrust and distrust mixed up but i very deep mistrust of 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 technology and 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 innovation i mean you still you have people right now who still insist that the 5g network is what caused the coronavirus you know like i mean it's still going on where it's 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 this idea of uh not only is it you know um, something new and modern, but it's something where it's like, is this insidious? Is this going to, to what, you know, degree is this going to control my mind and my life? Um, and also, I mean, um, I was thinking uh, as well, of just, um, yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to go over to questions so that we can, uh, so that we can pick up on those. Um, but Marilyn mentioned, um, interesting as well, was how Rat obtained the listening device that he has. And do you have any thoughts on that, um, about how he gets it? Oh, yeah, interesting. Um, so he, he borrows the radio from Katlbach, who uh, what is his um, former, uh, another of the tenants of um, Rat's former apartment that he, ha he moves out of um, in this season. Um, and Katzelbach is a journalist who, uh, as we learn during the scene when Rat borrows the listening device, has figured out the police cover-up, has, has actually uncovered the story about from season one about the policeman whose young son shot him and who was then sort of trotted out by the Berlin police as um, a, vict a shooting victim whose um, who's, uh, shooting justified the murder of civilians. Um, in this kind of uh, police cover-up, so uh, I'm not I'm not sure. I think that scene is very important. It's very important because Katzelbach um, is a, a jur journalist who's working to and continue. We'll see him continuing to do this uh, moving forward in the show. He's working to try to shine a light on some of the. Uh, super sketchy practices um, of the police and other institutions of German society at this time. And Katzelbach is also a Jewish character and um, that doesn't come out so strongly yet, but, um, but uh, is of increasing relevance later on in the show. Um, so I do think that scene is important because we learn what Katzelbach's investigative journalism has been uncovering. Um, and of course, Katzelbach is somebody who is involved in media, so it makes sense that he has a radio um, in that regard. I'm not sure. I would be interested if you have some other thoughts, um, Marilyn, about that topic yourself, um, please write a comment. Yeah. Um, so another um, attendee has um, pointed out um, the plot line from season one where they switch out, um, um, where they switch out Guerreon's um, medicine, his morphine with something else and um, has asked, I've been wondering what the results of that drug switch will be. And do you think that his dream scenes are at all related to the medicine that he's being given in place of the morphine? And I did notice that too, because I mean, you do see him uh, dosing a little bit more, like, you know, returning to his dosage. And it almost, I mean, and it, and it almost felt like it was there to remind you, don't forget, like he's not taking what he thinks he's taking. Um, so I thought about that as well. Absolutely. And he actually says to Helga, 
um, directly, like the medicine has changed. It's changed me and, mm -hmm. and it's changed the way, I, you know, the way that I function. Um, and um, right, we, we've seen in season one that um, the priest, in fact, was, uh, was one of the people who was involved in switching out the medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, we know that the priest was uh, um, working together with Dr. Schmidt, and we also have learned that Dr. Schmidt has a treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder or for shell shock uh, that involves this particular medicine together with suggestive therapy and, and other elements, behave, behavioral therapies and so forth. So, um, so certainly, yes, the drugs are definitely at stake in terms of the kind of hallucinative, hallucinatory visions that Rat um, has in this season and that's something to keep an eye on, absolutely. Yeah, and I remember um, a converse or a, a, a sort of a, an interaction or an exchange we had from one of the earlier conversations sort of about various, I, that was why I cut myself off earlier because I was going on about like, you know, the modernity and I was going to get too deep into like Walter Benjamin things. I was like, that is not the place. Um, <laughs> but the idea uh, at least of like certain things that were defining post-World War I modernity, one thing being you know, the rise of like mechanization, but also um, the rise of prostheses and questioning sort of what the um, human body even is at this time. And another thing that I remember that we talked about was also drug use and um, like how that chemically and physically and mentally, you know, in every way changes a person's um, body and how they function. So that sort of um, was something that I thought of as well. Um, in terms of like the way his drug use sort of is tying in with this increased focus on machinery and machines. Um, and on that, I was just gonna say, Jill has posed the question, um, your mention of the Kutcher novel reminds me of something I noticed about the creation of the series vis-a-vis -vis the novels. The Funkturm figures prominently in the second Kutcher novel, but the creators of Babylon Berlin really cleverly take images and visual vocabulary from later novels in the Rat series and weave them into the imagery in the series. Um, in the Kutcher novels, my sense is that many violent scenes take place at these scenes of Weimar modernity, making me wonder what kind of underlying critique of modern technology might be going on in the novels that's dealt with differently and in a much more nuanced manner in Babylon Berlin, for sure. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great point. I mean, I, I think that's absolutely true. There are some significant scenes of violence that take place at these kind of uh, iconic sites of Weimar modernity in the novels. And, and I, I really do think that the show develops a much more complex um, uh, sort of meta textual metacritical discourse on technology um, than the novels do, which are, are fair like you know fairly flat in, in their depiction of this topic um and uh, yeah i think you make a really a really interesting point there about sort of how babylon berlin um, draws on a lot of the same sites and signifiers from from the novels but actually um, um weaves them into a much more complex narrative um and we can talk about that more next week mm -hmm. and um Marilyn um, mentions on the topic of um, the treatment that uh, Rat is receiving, um, that also Krajewski was under the same treatment as Rat. Um, was he not? I think he was, yeah. And which also, I mean, add, to add on to that, so was the Armenian. I mean, there's other characters that exist in this show alongside Rat who are prominently featured, but you know, it's interesting to see the different directions that they've gone in as a result of the same, roughly the same um, treatment that they underwent with Anul Schmidt. Um, I would say that comparatively, the Armenian is doing pretty well <laughs> versus not and, and Kayevsky, but you know, um, that might be subjective. I don't know. But yeah. Well, you know, I, th I think that um, this season asks us to question a bit what this treatment really is and how it's being used. Um, and I, I kind of think that clip that I showed um, highlights this, you know, manipulative quality of Schmidt and, you know, the treatment, the, the really horrible treatment of Kayevsky throughout the whole first season of the show um, and his, um, his drug use, um, which may have been 
the result of the, the treatment that Schmidt uh, began him on um, does not end well for him, right? And he's constantly being um, maltreated by the police, among others, um, in the sequence, uh, in the in the season, the previous season. So I I, I do think um, yes, they they ostensibly are all kind of under the same treatment, and and the question is what is the intended outcome of this treatment actually and, and how does this treatment operate um, for, for the different characters. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on as we move forward um, talking about the show. Um, so Antonio has posed a question, there's a couple of questions about um, various characters and their relationships and how they're developing throughout the show. So Antonio has posed a question, I'm wondering about the relationship of Rat and Helga um, does the film suggest that the boy is his rather than his brother's? Um, he says, I don't think so, but if in the confession, Rat acknowledges that the relationship was going on for years, it could be possible. What do you think? Great, great observation. I think you are definitely picking up on something that's left very ambiguous by the show. Uh, and that is also really important. That is the paternity of Moritz, the, the son. Um, and there's a couple really key scenes that draw questions or open up questions or keep the question open about Moritz's pater paternity in the three episodes that we're talking about tonight. Um, particularly, there's a scene when Bruno and Rat are driving in the car together and, um, and Bruno kind of plays dumb <laughs> and asks Rat a bunch of questions about, um, you know, so I didn't know you had a kid and, and Rat, oh no, no, it's not my kid. And oh, but wait, isn't she your girlfriend? Oh wait, no, she's your sister. Is she your sister? Oh no, your sister-in-law, right? So there's this whole sort of um, rotation through all of the possible roles that all of the, <laughs> that, that this couple play, could possibly play uh, relative to one another. Um, and, and I think you really picked up on that. I, I think it's, it's not at all clear. I, I certainly think you're absolutely right. Um, the relationship has been going on for 10 years. There's also um, a, a hallucination or flashback dream sequence, not completely clear, this kind of vision that Rat has while he's on the airplane. I believe it's triggered when he's, when he's riding on the airplane and he, um, he sees the death of his mother, but he also sees Helga very pregnant, um, and she's um, her her evasive responses about when her affair started with his brother may underscore how we can't really know the truth about this question. So, uh, but I also think the question is quite important as we as we move forward and in terms of thinking about the relationships amongst these characters. Yeah, I thought that um, Bruno's, you know, sort of prodding that way, like purposely acting like he doesn't, like purposely being dense, you know, or obtuse, whatever, you know, and acting like he doesn't know how somebody could possibly be a nephew, like something. <laughs> I mean, he seemed like, I mean, you definitely see a, a sort of, emer it's been emerged at this point, uh, the sort of tendency he has to like to play with people when he has a suspicion or he has some knowledge. And that definitely, seem to come out there. And Heather actually posed the question, um, Bruno's character development in these episodes is fascinating. Can you share your thoughts about how his position is more clearly revealed as being corrupt? Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I do think his manipulative character is underlined across scenes like the one we've just been discussing. So that, uh, that's, part, that's part of it. Um, but we also, witness this very crucial scene where um, he, where Walter is together with the circle of people connected to the illegal Reichswehr who are importing poison gas uh, to Germany against the provisions of the Versailles Treaty. Um, and when Walter is with them, Jeneke is looking through the binoculars and spying on them. And um, if, you, if you look closely, um, there's this important sequence, kind of uh, shot counter shot sequence where Volter watches Yenika watching and Volter realizes that Yenika is spying on them and that he, rec he recognizes Yenika's, um, you know, 
uh, observation of him participating in the circle and, and knows that he's been exposed that way. And um, so uh, that piece of information is very important um, uh, in, in terms of what we'll see unfolding with the plot lines and I don't want to give any spoilers but um, but that that scene is, is a crucial one and we start to realize that Bruno is not a good guy. Yeah, and one thing that I noticed like in watching his character sort of unfold um, actually made some things that his character does seem like they were actually out of character as I understood him to be. For me I was telling my one friend that I talk about with the show with that um, the two things seemed out of character the more that Bruno seemed to develop to me as somebody who primarily gets off on having knowledge about people that they don't want him to have or having dirt on them, having secrets, information, uh, spying, you know, just knowing things and holding those things over their heads. Um, the one thing that felt um, now that I seem to be moving, now that I'm getting to know the character more, you know, that um, that he would you know, blackmail Lotta um, the way that he did in season one with sex, because to me it almost seemed like he wasn't interested in sex, but rather he could have done a lot more just holding that knowledge over her head that she was a sex worker. It seemed like it was an extra step for me that he took it to the level where he actually wanted to have sex with her, because it seemed to me that that's not the kind of thing that drives this man. And then the other thing being that they're watching, it, I think it was the last episode, where they're watching all of the, uh, the pornography that all of the prominent people are showing up in. And he's going, oh, I know that guy. I know that guy. I know that guy. And then the fact that he, I mean, he literally said at some point, he's like, this is life insurance. You know, like I could live off of blackmailing people with this document. And the fact that he lets Vlats burn it and he's just like, you sure? Okay. You know, like that, those two things, just knowing the way he seems to be unfolding seemed almost like they were out of place for him. Like he would have totally wanted to keep those reels. And yeah, I don't know what you might think about that. <laughs> but that just struck me as a little out of character for the way he's been developing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, he's, he's an absolute manipulator and out to take advantage of anything he can take advantage of, right? So yes, absolutely, I agree. And on the topic of like seeing spying, um, Michelle submitted the question. I really enjoyed the seeing and not seeing in these scenes, some that you've mentioned. There's also the many hanging panorama toys um, hanging in front of Yenika when he's spying on the meeting. This disturbing scene where Lotta's sister's husband's friend wants to see uh, Lotta's young sister in this negligee. Um, the nephew's attempts to find out what's going on in the basement and the palpable fear when Yenika knows he's being watched or followed, but we can't see that, or he can't see them. So, yeah. yeah, thank you. I, the, I, those were all um, actually examples that I have th thought of and didn't include. Hi, Michelle. Um, <laughs> and uh, I appreciate you bringing them up, especially that scene with, um, with Tony, Lata's younger sister. Um, that is a super um, creepy scene. And, um, you know, the subject of how Tony gets kind of interpolated into um, these, these really awful situations continues to be something that the show focuses on moving forward. Lata is always trying to uh, work hard enough that her sister can go to school and, and not um, be exploited by men in, in this way. Um, and this scene, I think, demonstrates uh, what, a, what a difficult uphill battle that is um, for young women growing up in the, in the tenements. At the, at the time. And um, so we do have a question about, um, a couple of questions about um, music. Um, so Jill has said a connection to Brian Ferry's appearance is the name of the pharmacy, Severine Apotheca, um, a reference perhaps to the Velvet Underground's album Venus and Furs. Um, to follow up on her last comment, it could also be a reference to Garion's older brother, Severin, who is not a character in the series, but he is in the books. And he left Germany for New York and sends uh, jazz records to Garion. Mm -hmm. um, she says these connections are so clever and nuanced. It's rich fodder for fan culture. <laughs> and then somebody else also was curious about how, if you know at all, how they got Brian Ferry to be a part of the show. Um, I personally do not know how they 
came out particular in particular. Um, but maybe you have any thoughts on that or Jill's comments? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I don't actually know for, for a fact um, uh, how they got Brian Ferry to be a part of the show, but I know that Brian Ferry has long had connections like to the crowd rock scene and to um, to Berlin and to German culture. And Tom Tickfer, um, one of the directors and writers of the show, has been very involved in the German music scene. He's also a composer himself and has composed some of the music or co-composed some of the music for the show. Um, and they brought in Brian Ferry as a co-composer for the show. So he um, I think he may have come on to the show first as someone involved in writing some of the music and someone who really makes sense as a choice because, as I mentioned, he um, has been very influenced in his own songwriting by the Weimar cabaret tradition and he's also recorded um, some of Vile's songs um, and other cabaret songs. Like I think he's recorded songs by Friedrich Hollander who uh, wrote some of the songs um, that um, were in the, the Blue Angel and the Dietrich song and things like that. So um, I think Ferry is a logical connection for this mashup aesthetic as somebody who sort of himself channeled Weimar music um, in his songwriting like in the 70s and 80s and then um, you know sort of comes back in, in a cameo in the show singing these songs that then appear as if they are songs from from the 20s and so there's this kind of um, you know mashing up of these different things together I think it's really great it's too bad that David Bowie um, was no longer with us um, you know during the shooting of the show, I guess, because he seems like he would have been another very uh, logical figure, someone else with strong ties to the German music scene and who uh, also, you know, drew on um, the Weimar cabaret tradition in his, uh, in his songwriting and in his persona and so forth and uh, might have been somebody else who, you know, somebody who's also played in German film history played a significant role showing up in cameo appearances in films like uh, Christiana F and things like that. So um, yeah, I, I think um, Ferry, you know, was like the, the, the next logical choice for sure in that regard. I can't imagine it having been like Iggy Pop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was a different kind of Berlin experience, but um, yeah, that would be a very Less interesting. Well able to pull off the cameo appearance at the MoCFT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would. The shirt would have come off in seconds. I mean, that's one thing that I know. Having seen Iggy Pop live, it showed up on the stage with the leather jacket, gone. <laughs> but um, also on the con, the, the topic of music, um, Lawrence um, says the use of music continues to be of interest. Composers from Mahler to Weil and Brecht, which you were going to comment on, and jazz. Um, are shown as part of popular entertainment during Weimar and also like Joel mentioned um, in the books at least, um, Gary Owen is receiving jazz records from his brother in New York. Um, but these are later banned when the Nazis take over. Are there any other examples of degenerate art in the series, like maybe the painting of the horse wearing the gas mask? Hmm. Great question. Um... I definitely think that it's most prominently there in the music, although there are so many examples of shots that draw really strongly on German expressionist art, like painters such as Otto Dix or George Gross, or we talked also about um, John Hartfield and his collage of of Zuragibel, for example, um, that, you know, almost seems to be referenced at, at times in the collage style aesthetic of the show. Um, so while I'm not sure that we see, you know, those paintings actually appear in the mise-en-scene of the show, we, the show itself uh, seems to draw on this whole tradition of quote unquote, degenerate art, as the Nazis um, referred to it um, in, in its aesthetic presentation. Um, so I, th I think you make a super interesting point there. And we will be talking more about Brecht and Weil next week. Um, but I also do like this, this sequence with, um, with the song Mir so um, the dance sequence with Helga and Gerion um, that you know, reprises this really popular kind of uh, tune from from 1930 by an artist who is not so well known anymore as, let's say, Kurt Weil, um, but who uh, was just smashingly popular in the early 1930s. And who, by the way, um, 
was a refugee from Hitler, had to leave Germany virtually overnight in, in 1933 and uh, fled through France and, and ended up in New York where he, I think never, ha so far as I know, never really had a, 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 was able to establish a singing career for himself again um, after being, you know, both a, a movie star and a, a very popular singer in, in Berlin in the, in the 30s. And um, one uh, comment um, back to just the idea of, of Bruno and like who he is and how he's developing. Um, Antonio has said, um, you know, we have characterized him as a very, you know, sort of going in a malicious direction. But he says Bruno's personality, though, is very rich. He's very nice to Lotta after she lost her mother and the way he takes on Rat's family. Um, he paints a great portrait of a nice guy, but then he is sort of accumulating info that's super valuable. Yeah, like the way he sort of just soaks up this knowledge of people, um, less so than the Armenian, but a lot of people are becoming increasingly indebted to him. Um, but yeah, good point of why he let go of the incriminating film so easily, which yeah, I agree. I, I didn't buy that he would have let that happen so readily. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think the show, you know, offers a very nuanced portrayal of this character and this maybe, you know, again, I don't want to give too much away, but this, this maybe um, traces back to the point that I was making at the beginning tonight about how, um, how the, the show really didn't want to represent Nazis or evil people as others, how it really wanted to show how, you know, familiar characters um, are the Nazis, how, you know, in the sense, like the, the, the seemingly sympathetic characters of the show um, do end up becoming Nazis and some of the less sympathetic characters of the show, but all the characters um, become accommodated to or are participating in the Third Reich and they really wanted to show these people not as as the other or as flat uh, one dimensional characters, they wanted to, to really emphasize a more complex depiction of them. And I think Bruno is such a great example and this actor, Peter Kortz is such, an, such a fantastic actor. I mean, I think he's really one of the best actors of the series. He's so able to embody that ambiguous quality that you're, that you're putting your finger on. Um, sorry, he was, was it Antonio who, who made yes. that comment? Yeah. Sorry. Um. Yeah, and another interesting comment on another character, um, Helga, which um, I think brings us to a, uh, a book that we both liked very much and we're referencing um, during last season's conversations from Mary Helen. She says, hi, Hester, what's your take on Helga as a female consumer and tourist visiting Berlin from the provinces? The Köln-Berlin connection reminds me a lot of Jungard Coyne's novels and several of the female characters like Greta, seem to bear similarities with Coyne's female protagonists. Oh yeah, hi Mary Helen, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I've talked about this previously, um, that I think the show quite uh, patently draws on Coyne's novels in its characterization of the women, especially Lotta, I think, um, uh, uh, is, shares many commonalities with Doris. I mean, she's not a, a tourist in Berlin, obviously she's a native Berliner, um, uh, unlike Helga, who, who like Coyne's protagonist, Doris comes from Cologne to Berlin. Um, but, but I think Lotta is actually much more like Doris than Helga is. I mean, Helga seems to be um, to me, a very kind of staid middle class character. Um, and uh, I was talking to Jill about this the other day. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more next week. Um, kind of kind of a really irritating <laughs> character. And it uh, was a little perplexing to us how the show um, chooses to kind of zoom in on her so much more um, when there are these other characters uh, who, who like Lotta and Greta and others who seem really um, to be much more interesting in terms of kind of channeling emergent discourses about gender and sexuality in the 1920s. Um, but I, again, I, I think you're absolutely right that the show is drawing on that. There's a couple scenes, um, also even in season three, a couple scenes that seem to be directly lifted from Coyne's novel, The Artificial Silk Girl, Das Konzern in Eaton, um, which was you know, a best-selling novel right around the time um, that the show is set, maybe just slightly later. Um, so thank you, yeah. Um, I think
think that's a great point. And um, Jill has also uh, it sort of bring us around uh, again to this commentary on sort of camp, I think, <laughs> that we were talking about, especially with um, Nissen. Um, Jill said, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the whole airplane sequence, particularly the near crash at the beginning and Grace's near plunge to death. This was one of my least favorite episodes because it was so rife with action movie cliches. How do you read it? Is this another form of cinematic parody? <laughs> Uh, yeah, great, great question. I mean, I, I read it as being more about the sort of prosthetic visuality of the airplane, um, you know, thinking about modern uh, technology um, and the way that it shapes and, and transforms vision um, as a key trope of Weimar culture. Uh, I think that the, the whole idea of taking um, a, a Leica, which is right, a brand new device, this early camera that can be, you know, actually held by Grief while he sticks his body on the door of the airplane um, to take pictures. Uh, I think um, the, the combination of both these men flying for the first time and seeing what it looks like to be up in the clouds and the impact that has on their bodies in motion um, and the use of then the, the camera and the prosthetic kind of visual device to, um, to, to capture those images is really interesting. So I was focusing, I guess, less on the action movie cliches <laughs> than on that development, although I think it also very much is this kind of pastiche or parody um, or mashup, I don't know what we're calling it right now, of, uh, of Triumph of the Will. I mean, those, those scenes of the airplane above the clouds are are practically um, re reenactments of these scenes from Triumph of the Will. And so um, there's there's a lot of dimensions going on to the sequence. Um, but I, I mean, I also think there's this very, again, kind of homoerotic moment when uh, Rat is holding grief and, um, and trying to sort of um, grasp his body and pull him back into the plane and they're kind of rolling around on the floor of the plane and um, and so there's there's something in this sequence that I that I found very interesting in that regard as well yeah <laughs> don't choke on your drink <laughs> yeah I don't want that to happen no wrong pipes um but yeah there's uh I mean especially with a character like Rat who comes I mean in physical contact with people so seldom i mean is the per you know when he does it you know it stands out so you're like okay like why is he touching that person why is that person touching you know because he's he's not a toucher he doesn't come off as a toucher so you know the various people that he has any kinds of sexual encounters with throughout the show um or any other physical contact i mean even like in season one where he gets in the slap match with volta i found that to be kind of homoerotic in a weird way i mean some manifestation of of of, of uh you know physical i mean contact between the two guys but they don't really know what to do with it so they're just gonna slap each other um you know versus like yeah. fighting with exactly. fisticuffs you know exactly. like, like, but um yeah, so um, I wanted to save this comment from Emily um, for um, sort of the last thing to bring up because we did want to um, come back around to the um, commentary on police. So she says, just a comment about the representation of the police. Something that came up for me in season one was the scene where the police said that the murders in the print shop were not a surprise and not a concern of the police. Can't remember the exact wording because it's basically Russian on Russian crime. This reminded me of the police failures to connect the murders of mostly Turkish shop owners of the of the early 2000s by the NSU. Sorry, that was going by really fast, Raleigh. I, I didn't get the total end of it. Um, oh, um, she says that they sort of dismissed it because it was Russian on Russian crime and therefore not really um, of interest to the police to further investigate. And she says, this reminded me of the police failures to connect the murders of mostly Turkish shop owners in the early 2000s by the NSU, which is like, for anybody who might not know what that acronym is, I'm, I, I forget what it stands for. It's National Socialist something, but it's like neo-Nazis. Yeah. Oh yeah, thanks for bringing it back to the police, Emily, and great point. I, um, I think it's very interesting how um, the, 
the police, the Berlin police are interested in the Russian crimes only when they can opportunistically take advantage of that interest in some way. Um, and I think the parallel that you draw is, is to the, to the um, murders of mostly Turkish shop owners by the NSU, NSU in the early 2000s is a, is a really interesting parallel um, that you know, probably arises from the same kinds of causes and might have been in the minds of the writers actually when they were, when they were writing this um, subplot of the show. Oh, and thank you, Emily. Emily said it's National Socialist Underground. Untergrund. Yeah, it's like a, it's basically the neo-Nazi movement in Germany. Um, and, um, and also on the topic of what we were talking about with homoeroticism, Michelle contributed the introduction to the beauty of the plane reminds me of Dr. Strangelove, Military and Men in Love with Their Planes, another film that speaks of homoeroticism. Yeah. I had a friend who wrote an entire art, I forget what it was, I forget where it was published, but it was an entire article essay about the phallic symbol in Dr. Strangelove, which, um, yeah, is, is, is uh, there's a lot of it, if you can get an entire essay out of that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so uh, I was wondering, Hester, do you have any other thoughts on the sort of what people watching today might take away from the portrayal of the police uh, in the show or, um, you know, like what, what do you take away from it as a person yourself who's watching this go down? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think the show is quite interesting and I, I would really be interested to hear other people's opinions about this topic. I, I think for me that it, it certainly doesn't valorize the police uh, especially in the second season where we begin to see a more ambiguous and complex viewpoint. But already in season one, you know, the entire plot revolves around police brutality, which is certainly not glamorized or, um, you know, valorized. Um, and uh, the premise of the show focusing on the brutal suppression of the workers by the police on so-called bloody May Day of 1929 um, really emphasizes that brutality and the fact that the social democratic police crack down on their fellow leftists um, and failed to um, create, you know, and by so doing failed to create a, a coalitional group that might have been more effective at combating the rise of the Nazis, you know, is, is a very salient component of the show's plot line. Um, and then, you know, regarding individual characters, you know, we begin, I think, thinking that Rat is a real hero, but in this season, he becomes much more of a uh, ambiguous character, you know, his anti-heroic qualities are evident and again like Antonio was saying before we sort of think that Bruno is this nice guy um, who's helping people out and again here he pays for Lotta's mother's funeral so um, so that uh, Lotta doesn't have to keep you know working to get the money for that um, and and doesn't have to allow her mother to be sort of carried away and have her body sold for medicine or whatever so um, so I think the ambiguity in the depiction of the characters, the individual police officers is very interesting. We also have Benda, for instance, who on the one hand is the person who suggests the police cover up of the um, May Day shooting of civilians, but on the other hand is um, working really hard to investigate the illegal smuggling of weapons into Germany and the connections of the illegal rice there. Um, so, you know, a very different kind of ambiguous character, but again, uh, kind of demonstrating that none of these figures uh, who are part of the police is immune from corruption and shady dealings of one kind or another. Um, and we see, you know, previously uh, acts of violence committed by the police en masse. And then in this season, we're also seeing individual acts of violence committed by specific characters who are police officers um, and that will continue to be a topic that we'll look at moving forward um, in our discussions of this season so um so for me it's it's 
it's quite nuanced in its depiction of the police um, in, in ways that I think it has to be um, historically and that are important to take note of. Um, I also think uh, that uh, its use of the noir aesthetic is important um, and the show does not always hew to that. We talked a lot about its, its kind of mashup aesthetic, its pastiche and the way that it takes different dimensions of different kinds of audiovisual culture, different styles and different genres and kind of puts them all together in a collage. Um, but often when it's depicting the police, it goes to that noir aesthetic and I tried to highlight that um, also in uh, Yenika's death scene, murder scene tonight. Um, and, you know, noir, I think, is, is important um, stylistically for um, its, uh, its overt, dark depiction of the corruption of the police um, as an institution and crooked cops as individuals as well. And so, like, I think that formal aesthetic choice on the part of the showrunners in dealing with this topic is also important. But I don't know. What do you think about it? Do you have other thoughts? I was going to say that one thing that um, struck me was that, I mean, it seems like such a simple concept, but it's something that I think people still struggle with these days is that the idea of a person, even if a person is sympathetic or even if a person, you know, you, you feel on their side as a character or as a person, you know, or they come across as likable or they're complex where they have likable and unlikable qualities like most people do. Um, that a sympathetic person can still be part of a corrupt institution that as an individual in an institution, you know, like it's, it's not something, um, it's not like there, there is a degree to which they can't be separated. Like, you know, I mean, people, many, many people, you know, not all blank, you know, like not all blank or like that, you know, like that's a lot of um, conversations that are coming up right now in conversations about various forms of systemic oppression. And that's always seems to be what the what one thing that people like to, to respond with. But um, when, pe when people are asked instead to sort of look at themselves and see themselves as a cog in a wheel or a, a larger um, system of um, oppression or violence or, or hatred or whatever you might call it, um, that they have a harder time to do that. And I think that that's coming out interestingly in, you know, the way we are you know, sort of learning more about um, Rath's mixed motives, about um, about Benda, you know, how he's at once, you know, kind of a sympathetic character, you know, and he's one of the few Jewish characters in the show that um, we get to see a glimpse into his life. But at the same time, he is the, I forget his official title, but he's like the head of the political police, you know, and so that they at once hold these roles where they are human beings who just have lives and thoughts and, you know, but they are also working for something that is, um, acting in an unjust and, and corrupt way. And um, it points to, out to us, I think, in an interesting way, that something that, yeah, people are still having problems with to reconcile that everybody in that system is in some way complicit in that system, even if you like them personally, it, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, so that was one thing I took away as, as it relates to sort of what's going on today. Um, so yeah, it's sort of like, the, it's complicated to necessarily go, oh, that's a bad guy or that's a good guy, you know, and, and lots of people, of course, want to say, you know, as far as the criticism of the police that's going on right now, you know, oh, but there's certain police who are doing this, they're picking out a lot of stories where they're going, this police officer did this in, in Houston, or this one did this in, in, you know, Seattle, you know, like various little acts of, of, you know, of, of like, look, it's not always, you know, but still there's this overarching theme that people, you know, um, I don't think they're ignoring. I think it's just something that people might have trouble, you know, sort of wrapping their head around. Yeah. I think you make a great point. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up our first conversation of season two of Babylon Berlin. Thank you all so much for your great questions and comments. Um, this was really great to dive back into this and pick apart these episodes <laughs> with you all and with Hester. Um, and um, we hope that you all join us next week um, because we will have, uh, for episodes four, five, and six, we will have as a guest, uh, Professor 
Um, Dr. Jill Smith from Bowdoin College up in Maine will join our conversation. Um, you have seen uh, several of her great contributions to the conversations throughout these discussions. So she'll actually be on our Zoom uh, a little gallery view or whatever with us um, having this dialogue. So um, we really look forward to that. Um, and we hope that you can join us. Um, once again, thank you so much for supporting our program um, and thank you for um, tuning in to us this evening. Uh, we're really glad that we've been able to continue doing this. And also a big thank you to the Friends of the Goethe Institute um, or Foggy, who has um, generously given us um, funding in this time where our programming at Goethe um, is being stretched a little thin because of the pandemic. Um, they have very kindly given us um, funding um, to continue this um, series and for that we're very thankful. So thanks again to our Friends of Goethe Institute. Um, and yeah, um, we hope that, I hope that you all have a great weekend, great evening. Um, and I'll pass it over to Hester if she has any thoughts. Oh, it was a super great discussion tonight. I really appreciate everyone's contributions, comments, really thoughtful, insightful comments. And uh, thank you so much for being here, everyone. I hope you'll be back next week. It's going to be really fun uh, to have Jill here and um, looking forward to the conversation again. So um, take care, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks, Raleigh. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye, everybody.